Good afternoon. My name is Amy Kaji. Thank you for having me. Um, I've been asked to introduce myself, so I'm going to uh, give you a little background as to why I'm the one doing this lecture. Um, I am an emergency physician by training. I work at Harbor UCLA, the county facility, facility, and I also work once a week as a community ER physician at Long Beach Memorial. After I did my emergency medicine residency at Harbor, uh, it was 2002, right after September 11, 2001, when there was a lot of grant funding available for research fellowships and preparedness training. And at that time, I decided to pursue an MPH in uh, epidemiology at the UCLA School of Public Health. There I studied disaster preparedness, and then I went on to get a PhD in epidemiology, um, all to enhance disaster preparedness and to better understand how we can be better prepared in the county. Um, my thesis in public health was about hospital disaster preparedness, and what I did was I went to 43 hospitals in L.A. County, uh, went on site to all the hospitals, conducted a survey, looked at the types of equipment and supplies each of the hospitals had, and compiled them uh, in a survey. And then I also observed disaster drills at various hospitals and see, to see what kind of information could be garnered from that. Today's topic is disaster triage, and I just want to thank Dr. Zoraster, he's sitting right here in the front, who um, is the director of the Hospital Preparedness Program, and he gave me some valuable feedback and gave me some ideas as to um, interest all of you. So the lecture objectives today will be to introduce disaster mass casualty triage concepts, uh, to help you understand that priority will be on stabilizing patients first and foremost rather than actually healing them when you're seeing these patients. To also have you understand that you may be asked if you're in a disaster situation to perform care outside your normal scope of practice. So even if you normally don't care for kids, you may be asked to care for kids. There will also be an emphasis on improvisation of your skills and what you may be asked to do in flexibility rather than in-depth knowledge of care of the disaster topic. Uh, finally, you will note that decisions will be made with limited information in the aftermath of a disaster. So you may not have much information about the patients. You may not know their name. You may not know their medical history, et cetera. And we'll discuss some of the legal implications of doing so. So September 11, 2001 kind of changed the whole paradigm of disaster preparedness. This is when we realized as a nation that um, there are a lot of gaps in our ability to care for mass casualty incidents. These three examples that I'll provide, September 11th, Madrid bombing, and the London bombings, uh, are all examples how, of how hospitals dealt with an influx of victims. Um, so at 8.46 on September 11th, the American Airlines Flight 11 hit One World Trade Center North Tower. And then at 9.05, United Airlines hit one, 175, hit the South Tower. St. Vincent's, which is the major hospital in downtown Manhattan, uh, basically received almost all the victims. Uh, and at that time, when they were expecting all these victims, they had to think very rapidly uh, as to how they would make the space and how they would accommodate for all these incoming victims that they were expecting. Uh, so what they did, um, they are a level one trauma center and they have 500 beds, but they canceled all their elective surgeries, which is part of most hospital disaster plans. Um, they rapidly moved 15 ICU patients to the floors and they made 73 additional beds. How did they do so? They made beds in places that they normally don't care for these patients. So the PACU beds were made available for uh, patients. The ambulatory surgery unit was open for patients. The hemodialysis unit, they canceled their normal hemodialysis patients and they made room for uh, hospital patients. The endoscopy suite was prepared. And the cath lab, you know, you could hold some patients there as well. By 9.05, there was an ER physician and a nurse at every single bedside of the department. And the emergency department regist registered 426 patients on the first day 
plus 248 were seen in the adjacent eyewash facility. That's a massive number of victims. It's actually estimated that over 800 victims were cared for, some without documentation, um, were seen that day. So quite a lot. And they admitted 78 patients. They also had established a family center next to the ED because there will be issues of family reunification after any type of disaster. The second one uh, incident, Madrid, Spain, the September 11th for Spain, basically, uh, occurred on March 11th, 2004. This is pretty amazing. Uh, so at 7.39, 10 bombs uh, went off in commuter trains. 177 were killed. Over 2,000 were injured. This one hospital, it is an 1,800-bed teaching hospital, mind you, but um, they saw an amazing number of patients. They canceled all their surgeries just like they did in Manhattan. They discharged 161 patients in under two hours. That's a massive number. And at 7.30, there were 123 patients in the emergency department, and two hours later, there were only 10. They canceled all their elective diagnostic procedures. They opened their recovery rooms um, as potential ICUs, and they also established an information center. They saw 312 patients, and they hospitalized 91. The third incident, the London bombing in 2005. This is their 9-11. Uh, at 8.50 on July 7th, three bombs went off on commuter trains. At 9.47, another bomb went on, off on a commuter bus. 56 were killed at once. 775 were injured. At the one major hospital that bore most of the patients, this is a 675-bed six, hospital with a large ED volume, 120,000 per year, and it is a trauma center. But um, at this time, when the incident actually occurred, six ORs were already running. So what do you do with the patients that are on the table? Um, amazingly enough, they were able to clear the surgical operating suites within two hours. They also moved their ICU patients to the floors, the ones that they could. could. Um, vented patients in the ICU were transferred out. They decided at that time that they would only do the studies that were immediately necessary. So head CTs they thought were critically necessary. So they did head CTs. Rather than doing body CT scans or chest CT scans, they decided that they would just do a bedside ultrasound or a fast scan. And initially, they determined that only damage control surgery would be performed rather than actually fixing the problem in the operating room, which would take several hours. And they used uh, over 130 units of blood. On that date, they saw 194 patients, and 27 were considered seriously injured. So mass casualty triage, obviously, is a critical skill. Um, at some point, one of our hospitals will receive an influx of victims. The historical concept of triage actually resulted from the need of militaries to efficiently treat multiple ba battlefield casualties. So it's a military concept. Triage actually occurs at different times and it's performed by different types of hospital personnel or uh, healthcare personnel. So um, in the field, paramedics do triage. They decide who needs to go to a trauma center, who needs to go to a STEMI receiving center, et cetera. In the emergency department, the triage nurse or the ED nurse gets to decide which patient goes back next to the, um, most, the next open treatment room, who gets seen by the physician first. And the ER doctor, if there are only, there's only one ICU bed remaining, we're the ones who kind of triage and decide which patient who's boarding in the emergency department for several hours to days gets the next ICU bed. So when and why is triage necessary? Triage, which is defined as a sorting of patients um, for treatment, is necessary if there's resource scarcity. Triage is also necessary then during a disaster, which is defined as uh, when the destructive effects of natural man-made forces overwhelm the ability of a given area or community to meet the demands for health care. That's an ASAP definition or American College of Emergency Physicians definition. Basically when the resources outstrip your supplies. So Hurricane Katrina, the Haitian earthquake, 
the H1N1 pandemic, all these are examples of need to steward scarce resources. But how does disaster triage differ from daily triage? <clears throat> I kind of consider this like a different point on a continuum. So you can compare triage in the ED, which when you compare it to a disaster scenario, it's resource rich, versus disaster where there's total chaos and there are scarce resources. The continuum is basically based on the amount of resources that you have um, to the number of patients who must be valued and treated simultaneously. How else does it differ? So during a disaster or mass casualty incident, decisions have to be made much more quickly. Uh, and obviously there's less information upon which you're gonna be making these decisions to care for patients. Um, unfortunately, for example, uh, if you're caring for patients in the emergency department, normally during daily triage, we have the luxury of getting the paramedic run or the paramedic report about what types of patients we will be receiving. In a disaster situation, we say that the majority of patients self-transport, or 80% self-transport, so they will bypass EMS and we will not have the luxury of receiving a pre-hospital care report or an EMS report. So we don't have this information and we will be caring for patients we know nothing about. There's also a principle in disaster medicine. We always say we want to do the greatest good for the greatest number. And so the emphasis shifts from doing the greatest good for one individual to the greatest good for the greatest number. And um, therefore, ethical principles come into play. And whereas in a daily situation, we're thinking about who gets the next ventilator next, not who will ever get a ventilator in a disaster situation. It's basically, will they ever get a ventilator? Will they ever get blood? Finally, the consequences of the decisions that you make during disaster and mass casualty triage differs in that probably the consequences are far greater. You're going to be making decisions like, what patient should you treat next? The moderately injured patient with severe bleeding who could bleed to death, or the one with an unprotected airway? Or are you going to con continue to administer blood to this patient when there's only 10 more units of blood left? And which of these victims should be taken to the OR, if at all? And who will receive the last remaining ventilator? So one other aspect of disaster triage. So during a daily triage in the emergency department, the nurse does the triage. In disaster triage, we want the most experienced physician leader who's equipped to care for these patients to do triage, ideally. If it is a trauma incident that involves lots of surgical patients, then ideally you want a surgeon to determine who needs to go to the OR right away, who doesn't. There are several types of disaster triage systems that are well published in the literature. Uh, they are all field triage systems. Uh, and unfortunately, none of them uh, have been validated in terms of how well they function in a real situation. So there are 10, and two are pediatric specific. Uh, what's been found is that there's really very little consistency in which system is used from one jurisdiction to the next all across the United States. So most of these triage systems use a four or five category scheme based on physiological criteria, and most use respirations, perfusion, and mental status, so those are the three criteria. However, they vary in how they measure these uh, physiological criteria like respirations or perfusion. Some may measure cat refill, another may measure blood pressure, et cetera. <coughs> Again, none of these are validated. So you can imagine why these aren't validated. Uh, so one of the criteria for one system says that respirations greater than 30 is a criteria to make someone uh, a high level triage category, but very few nurses or physicians are patient enough to measure someone's respirations up to 30. So you can imagine how there's some reliability issues as well as some validity issues. Most of these triage systems are based upon global sorting. So you want to basically begin to identify who is least injured. And one of the best ways to do that is to see who is ambulatory. And the reason for that is if someone is ambulatory, they're mentating, 
they're perfusing their brain, they have good perfusion uh, to their extremities as well because they can ambulate. And they're likely uh, to be able to follow other commands as well. So we'll review two triage systems. One is simple triage and rapid treatment, and then there's a pediatric version of that called Jumpstart. Uh, in the handout in the back, there's a schematic of the Jumpstart, but I'll just briefly review Start for us. Uh, and then there's another one called SALT that I'll review. And there are several others, as I mentioned. There are eight others that are listed here. And the reason why I wanted to give an example for START is because this is what is used in Los Angeles. So the mnemonic or the acronym stands for Simple Triage and Rapid Treatment, or START. And it's based upon four triage categories. Uh, the first is immediate, and these are the most severely injured. It's red, and it's based upon respirations greater than 30, they have no radial pulse, or they have an altered mental status. Delays are yellows, and basically these patients need a gurney, but they're not actually an immediate patient. Minor patients are green. These patients can ambulate independently. They're mentating, they're perfusing. They have minor injuries for which they may not even need to seek care for the next days or weeks. And then deceased or expectant, these are black patients. Um, basically, these are patients after which you perform a head tilt or a jaw thrust, and they have no respirations, they're apneic, and so there's no use in expending a lot of resources in resuscitating this person. So some examples of triage categories, immediate would be someone with an airway problem or even someone with a tension pneumothorax. If you performed a simple needle thoracostomy, you could alleviate that and it wouldn't be so difficult to um, resuscitate them. An example of a delayed patient would be someone with a fracture or a large hematoma even, um, minor burns as well. Minor patients are basically those with minor lacerations, contusions, abrasions, et cetera, uh, that may not need care at all. And then expectant or dead patients are, are those with obvious severe burns, those in cardiac <coughs> arrest, or those with severe head injury. Okay, so uh, how does this work? In START, they would, if you can imagine a mass casualty situation in the field, um, there would be someone out there, a triage officer, who would say, anyone who can walk, walk over here. So someone's going to move the walking wounded. Those patients would be labeled minor. Um, the next patients would be, if no one has a, if someone does not have a, any respirations after a head tilt and a jaw thrust, those patients would be labeled expectant. Those patients who are breathing rapidly with a respiratory rate greater than 30 would be labeled immediate. Those patients without a radial pulse or a cap refill greater than two seconds would also be labeled immediates. And patients who are unable to perform simple commands would also be labeled immediates. If they have stable respiration, perfusion, and mental status, they would be labeled a delayed patient. So you can see how this is a little bit complicated and why this is not a validated system and the reliability would have some issues. So this start was used in the Metrolink crash in 2008. I don't know if you guys remember, but uh, this occurred in Chatsworth. The number dead were 25. There are 135 injured. And one of my friends, actually, uh, Chris Kahn, studied this retrospectively to see how well um, these patients were triaged using START. So they found, retrospectively, that using START, they, 64 patients had been triaged correctly, or a little under half. Uh, 65 were over triaged, or nearly half were over triaged, and 2% were under triaged, which isn't bad. You know, ideally, you want people to be over triaged rather than under triaged, which is the principle in trauma triage as well. Um, another study, actually, of uh, 1,144 trauma patients using START demonstrated a relatively good sensitivity and specificity. So the numbers are somewhat all over the place, 85% and 85% sensitivity and specificity. So the reason why SALT was developed, that's not another system called the Nat SALT National Triage Guidelines, is because there was so much variability across the U.S. in what triage system was being used. They 
depend upon global sorting, followed by individual assessment, then performing any life-saving interventions if needed, and then treating or transferring the patient. Intuitively, this makes sense to me. Uh, the first step is to actually do a global sorting. So um, you are going to make that big announcement, anyone able to walk, walk over here. And so those people, that category of patients would be treated or assessed last. Then you would say, anyone able to wave? You know, they may have a leg injury. And those people would be assessed second to last. The people who remain, they're lying injured, would be the patients that you would want to assess first because they may have some type of life-threatening injury. So in your assessment, you are going to be performing life-saving interventions that can be quickly performed. So control of major hemorrhage with point pressure would be an example, opening an airway with a jaw thrust or a head tilt, uh, doing chest decompression with a needle thoracostomy, um, or if it's a nerve agent exposure, would be an auto-injector antidote. The next step would be to say, is this patient breathing? If they're not and they're apneic, they would be labeled expectant and no other resuscitative measures would be performed. If they are breathing, then you go on to this next box, which is, do they obey commands? Do they make purposeful movements? Do they have a peripheral pulse? Are they not in respiratory distress and is major hemorrhage controlled? If all those answers are yes, then you go to treatment or transport. If they have minor injuries, they would be minimal patients or minor patients. And if they're more than minor, they would be declared delayed. Finally, if they have none of these and you don't think that the patient is likely to survive, they would be labeled expectant. However, if you think that the patient could be viable given the resources that you have at that very moment, they would be labeled an immediate. So one of the principles that is emphasized in disaster triage is that um, you're going to be stabilizing these patients rather than actually treating them. For example, with the person with the tension pneumothorax, you will be stabilizing them, meaning that you will be performing a needle thoracostomy. You may not be the one to be doing the tube thoracostomy and ho hooking that tube to suction. So immediately, you're just going to be stabilizing patients. You're going to be applying point pressure to hemorrhage. This idea about stabilizing also extends towards surgery as well. So if there are a lot of tra traumatic sur surgical issues, then you don't want one patient taking up 18 hours of your operating room time. So the emphasis will be, again, on damage control surgery. You're going to go in, they're going to stop the bleeding, they're going to pack the abdomen, and then they're going to come out, they're going to go to the ICU. They're going to take the next patient who's bleeding. They're going to stabilize them in the operating room, they're going to take the next patient, just like that. The other principle is that really the emphasis is on doing basic interventions, the easiest interventions, and these are probably the most valuable interventions in a disaster situation. So when there are a lot of victims the most critical intervention in some type of traumatic incident is probably hemorrhage control. And hemorrhage control is really easy. You just apply point pressure. You hold pressure for 15 minutes, and that's easy. And you can teach that to anyone, but it's easy. Same with basic airway maneuvers. It's easy. Head tilt, jaw thrust, very easy. Those are basic maneuvers that can be done. It's not on complex surgical techniques. It's not on uh, your, your knowledge of physiology and anatomy that matters. Another principle is that you as a physician may be asked to perform in a capacity that you do not normally practice. So um, even though Good Sam may not normally care for pediatric patients, if there is a disaster involving many pediatric victims, you may receive pediatric patients. Um, again, what I said before is that the majority of patients self-transport. They see a hospital, they have a child that's injured, they're going to go to the nearest hospital. So every hospital will receive all types of victims, be it burn, be it pediatrics, et cetera. And even though LA County, we're lucky in that we do have a lot of pediatric specialty care centers and trauma centers, those centers are going to be overwhelmed too. So you will need to stabilize patients prior to those patients being transferred to a specialty care center.
And this is why we say all disasters are local, because you will have to care for whatever patients come to you, and patients will come to you. Um, this is also why we say that at a minimum, we want every single hospital to have the capacity to care for every type of victim. And so uh, we want even hospitals that don't normally care for kids to have a Braslow tape so they can do age and weight-based dosing for medications, et cetera. They should have um, pediatric endotracheal tubes and laryngoscope blades at some basic level. There should also be a mechanism whereby you have some type of just-in-time training so that if you're not you're usually accustomed to caring for burn patients, at least you have some algorithm or some basic slides that you can use to educate your staff to care for these victims. I do want to emphasize that in LA County, we are lucky because we do have this hospital preparedness program. And so, um, for example, the burn surge program, the trauma burn surge program, uh, the trauma disaster resource centers of which there are, are 14, um, they stockpile equipment and whatnot so that if a non-trauma center receives victims of trauma, they could make use of the equipment and supplies that are stored at our DRCs. Um, similarly, the pediatric surge program exists and it's in development. For example, they did a gap analysis recently to determine what our capacity was to care for pediatric victims. And uh, they are developing educational programs, just-in-time training booklets, so that these can be distributed to all hospitals in LA County uh, so that all hospitals are prepared to a certain extent to care for both pediatrics and burns and trauma. This is an anecdote from the New England Journal of Medicine that uh, struck me when I was reading it. This is a summary of, um, summary of events after Hurricane Katrina. So uh, there was a woman by the name of Joyce uh, who said, what can I do to help? And she was the newest member of the Baton Rouge Field headquarters of the American Red Cross. And in the description of Joyce in the New England Journal, it said, through those early days of frantically assessing the safety and needs of the population and planning the medium-term response, Joyce was one of the most valuable members of the team. Without question, without complaint, she made copies, gave directions, furried people around in her car. Her only expectation was to help. She had dropped everything to volunteer. She had left her work, her daughter, her grandchildren behind, and at the end of her two-week session, she would return to her life. Another of the many anonymous volunteers who responded to the crisis. Once back at home, she would resume her usual work as a thoracic surgeon. And so, you know, there will be menial tasks that need to be done. And but wherever you can help, you the best thing is to be flexible and be willing to do different um, different tasks that you may be asked to do. I thought that was very humbling. Okay, so the expectant category is a category that is difficult for all of us as providers to consider. Um, no one really wants to say this person is not salvageable. Is it just not something that we normally do on a daily basis? But in a disaster situation when you're trying to do the most good for the most people, this may become necessary. It also allows the providers to focus resources on potentially salvageable patients. It's a category that is needed really if there, are, if there are just not enough resources available to meet the demand. And whether or not there are expectant patients really should depend upon the magnitude of the incident, the available resources, which hopefully will change. You know, in the immediate aftermath, you may not have resources, but hopefully as resources filter in from elsewhere, you may be caring for victims that previously you would have labeled expectant, but now you think that you have the resources to care for them, and they would be labeled immediate patients rather than expectant patients. It also depends upon a provider's level of comfort with using the category of expectant. And many people are not comfortable saying that this patient is expectant. Okay, so an example of a patient who you might debate, is this an expectant patient or an immediate patient? So let's take a 32-year-old male who has a blood pressure of 80 over 60. His GCS is 15. He has multiple injuries, including shrapnel to the left upper quadrant. He has free fluid on 
an ultrasound in the emergency department. He has a bleeding scalp wound. He's hypoxic to 85%, and he's still hypotensive after a chest tube is placed, and he's received multiple liters of IV fluid. So if there are five critical patients, you know, maybe you do have enough resources to care for him. You would probably label that patient an immediate. But if there are 50 critical patients, you're probably going to have to label this patient an expected patient and write them off. And obviously, if there are 500 critical patients, that patient's an expected expectant patient. So there are some thoughts, you know, depending upon what resources you have, given that the case fatality rate for a person with an injury severity score greater than 15 is, you know, greater than 5%, if there are 500 patients with critical injuries with an ISS greater than 15, you might consider a patient with an ISS greater than 15, all of them expectant. You might also consider making those with a GCS less than five, so those patients who would need to be intubated, all expectants as well, given their high uh, case fatality rate. You may not even have ventilators anyway uh, to keep them on a ventilator. Uh, because of the expectant category, um, obviously this brings into play the whole issue of ethics. And um, this is a basic ethical framework for disaster triage. So um, fairness. By fairness, we mean that the triage process is inherently just to all individuals and that the process itself treats all individuals equally who have equal needs. By duty to care, we mean that physicians have a duty to care as best as they can for all victims of the incident. The duty to steward resources, by that we mean that physicians have a duty to attempt to obtain the best outcome, again, for the greatest number of patients with the resources that are currently available. By transparency, we mean that the process of triage and the criteria for triage should be as transparent as possible. By consistency, we mean that the process should be applied in the same way to all presenting for care. By proportionality, we mean that the degree of resource restriction uh, would be the same to all, uh, would be uh, proportional to the demands, rather. And by accountability, we mean that uh, we should be able to defend the decisions that we make and be answerable to them. And this might involve documentation and potential review of decisions by institutions and agencies. So some of the factors that could influence your resource allocation, uh, one example of this is the American Medical Association organ donation criteria. Uh, so you might want to consider things like, what is the likelihood of benefit to this person? How could it change their quality of life? How long would it benefit this patient? The urgency of the need and the amount of resources required. The AMA says that in terms of organ donation, you should not consider these things. You should not consider sex, race, the ability to pay, social worth, the perceived obstacle to treatment, the patient contribution to illness, like whether or not it's self-inflicted, like alcoholism or smoking, and past resource use of the patient. I thought I could bring up an example of, say you have a scarcity of oxygen, how might you deal with it? So, you would try to reallocate limited oxygen supply to patients who need it, need it most, obviously. You might restrict the oxygen flow rate because then you would use less oxygen. You might want to restrict the use of nebulized treatments because, again, that would use more oxygen. You might say no one should get an albuterol nebulized treatment. Instead, they should get only the um, MDIs. You might want to revise your clinical targets. Usually, we're only comfortable saying keep the oxygen saturation greater than 92%. You might say, well, in this case, you might want to decrease that target to 88% or 87%. <laughs> and you may consider reusing oxygen equipment and delivery devices after appropriate disinfection or sterilization. Yuck. <laughs> but you might have to do that. But the big question, I think, that arises when people talk about allocating resources is this question. So if I allocate resources in practice crisis, quote unquote, or quote, altered standards of care, will I be sued for malpractice? And uh, the one case that has gotten a lot of press is the case of Dr. Anna Poo uh, after Hurricane Katrina, who was a cancer surgeon, and she worked at the Louisiana State University School of Medicine and basically, she um, 
implemented some in intentional euthanasia. And after that incident, um, prosecutors made a case to convict this physician. Um, the good news was that ultimately the Orleans Parish Grand Jury refused to indict her. Um, but it is often cited as a reason for malpractice or liability reform in the aftermath of a disaster. The Institute of Medicine, in response to this question, um, created a schema of medical care rendered during disaster in a continuum. So they said that basically it could be conventional care, which is basically when you use your usual resources and stretch them a bit, um, you use your usual number of beds, staff, et cetera, uh, followed by contingency care, which is when you start adapting what you have, uh, such as using the post-anesthesia care unit to care for some of these victims, uh, to crisis care or altered standards when <coughs> Uh, you basically are doing what you can with what is available. And this is the schema that you have. So just say um, your facility is severely damaged, you can't even use your hospital, you may resort to using classrooms and the conference rooms to care for patients, and that would be your patient carrier, and that's crisis standards of care. But if you had a hospital available, you could potentially you know, use uh, the PACU. And then, obviously, if you're in normal situations, then you could use your usual bed space. This is a pretty controversial topic, this whole issue of crisis standards of care. And there have been several articles in the Annals of Emergency Medicine uh, debating it as to what this actually means. Does it mean that we're free to practice medicine like we're in the third world? I don't think so. Um, basically, I think really when we talk about crisis standards of care, we really mean that um, we would reduce, it, we would not reduce the legal standard or duty of care for medical responders. Rather, we would say that um, we would uphold the standard that dictates what a prudent healthcare provider would supply under similar circumstances. So by that, here's an example. So after the Haitian earthquake, uh, what would a reasonably prudent surgeon do if he were confronted with a patient requiring a life-saving amputation, but he has no surgical equipment available? Would it be standard of care to use a hacksaw sterilized by fire? Cons would that be consistent with his legal duty to care and the medical standard of care, given the limited resources? And I think a prudent surgeon would say, given that scenario, that probably meets the medical standard of care, even though today at Good Samaritan, obviously that would not meet the standard of care. So a few things about um, crisis standard of care and liability concerns. Uh, once a disaster is declared a federal disaster, restrictions may be lifted, such as the four to one nursing ratio, as well as HIPAA, depending upon your state and federal regulations. Um, there are also other governmental waivers of regulatory requirements regarding space, staffing, et cetera, um, that would be lifted once the incident is labeled a federal disaster. The problem with that and the re reality of it is that it often takes two to three days before a disaster is actually declared a federal state of emergency. So it doesn't actually happen in the immediate aftermath of the incident when you may be faced with this influx of disaster victims. Uh, so like in Madrid and London, in those few hours after the incident occurred, the federal government is not going to say, this is a federal de federally declared disaster. Uh, the four to one ratios are lifted, the HIPAA violation, uh, those don't apply. For me, um, you know, this is just my opinion, but for me in the immediate aftermath, I would say that because the federal government will not step in immediately, uh, even if they have the best intentions to do so. Uh, this raises the importance of documentation. So if you're gonna be labeling someone expectant that you normally would not, or you're going to be um, using a hacksaw to perform an amputation, I think one of the best measures would be to document. Document why you think this patient is expectant. Document why you needed to use a hacksaw uh, to perform this amputation. And I think there would be some benefit in two physicians. 
uh, documenting why. There may not be that much time, but I think two-physician documentation would be very valuable. Um, so other realities, you know, as I mentioned before, if there are a lot of victims, surgeons may only be performing damage control surgery where they're just tamponading bleeding. Um, other considerations would be saying, maybe patients that warrant a surgery longer than two hours shouldn't be taken to the operating room at all. If the ICUs are full, maybe damage control surgery shouldn't even be performed, and maybe those patients should be labeled expectant. And perhaps patients with injury severity scores uh, that are greater than 15 or a GCS less than five shouldn't be operated on either. And uh, some Red Cross surgeons actually say that, uh, spells the concept that everyone should wait overnight. <laughs> no one should be operated on in the very first day uh, because that way you won't expend your resources um, on high utilizers. And the patients who will most likely be viable will declare themselves. So the reality is really that uh, three kids in a bed might be a reality, you know? You may not have one person in one bed. There may be two to bed. You may have eight people in one room rather than two. So in conclusion, uh, the mass casualty triage, basically we emphasize the population good rather than the individual good. We emphasize stabilizing the individual, doing basic maneuvers, uh, such as point pressure to a bleeding wound, basic airway maneuvers, uh, head tilt, jaw thrust, versus actually healing a patient. Um, and the ability of all physicians to care for all types of patients, uh, even patients that you don't normally care for, like pediatric patients or burn victims, uh, and for providers to be very flexible in what they're willing to do in the aftermath of a disaster. If it means that the greatest good for you at this very moment is to make a copy of this patient's medical record, even though you're a cardiothoracic surgeon, maybe that's what's needed. And yeah, you may have to step in to make some copies. Also that in a disaster situation, you will be making decisions with very little information, and we may need to implement what we call altered standards of care or crisis standards of care. We just have a list of references at the end. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Yes? What's the difference between what this and a declaring a patient to expect? I think there's very little difference um, in that, quite honestly, you know, except that um, expectant is a term that's used really for triage, uh, but triage is a dynamic process in my opinion. So triage occurs in the field, but those field triage systems were made for the pre-hospital setting. But triage occurs in the emergency department. Triage continues to occur because you're reassessing their vital signs, you're reassessing what type of resources that you have available. And Dr. Pu, you're right, she triaged. She said, this patient, given the resources that we have right now and the time it's gonna take for the helicopter to come and rescue this patient, no way, make this person comfortable. Practice intentional euthanasia, so that's what she did, yeah. I would imagine that in a real crisis situation, um, an overflow situation, the documentation would be kind of a disaster. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, and it may be any references, are there systems available to refer to, to for us to prepare for that? Because that's probably important. I don't know of any. You know, um, you're right. In most disaster situations, you are going to be rushed. And as I mentioned in I think 9-11, um, many patients were cared for and had no documentation. Um, but I think in a situation in which you're faced with a critical situation like labeling someone expectant or removing someone from a ventilator, I think that's the time when you would try to document. Whereas maybe if you're taking care of a bleeding wound or a laceration repair, perhaps those are the cases in which you would say, I don't have the time to document that um, I used 40 nylon and I performed simple sutures uh, and I probably did 10 stitches. And you know, I would probably try to skimp on documentation on other areas, but I would try to document heavily 
if I had to label someone expectant. Yeah, I'm just thinking even in terms of the patient may not even be identified or, you know, keeping the record with the patient, you know, people may write things and it may, God knows where it's going to go. Yeah. Uh, Right. No, that's that's definitely something that we practice. Uh, most hospitals, when they have disaster drills, hopefully they realize that patient tracking is a big issue. And oftentimes um, there are issues where they don't have an ID. And um, we've discussed what we would do in that situation. For example, taking pictures of patients, uh, keeping their belongings with them. And then that also brings up the whole issue of what happens when you have a kid who comes in with an injured parent. What do you do with the kid? How do you keep those two together? Um, but all those things we practice, try to discuss, they are really important issues. 